Hello and welcome to our monthly Zoom session. Topic today is dedicated to contemporary icons of contemporary saints because we are experiencing specific issues when we have to think of these commissions because we have photographs, we have our special circumstances, so a lot, a lot of consider and I'll try to speak about these things and I hope you'll find something interesting for yourself. So canonization of new martyrs and other new saints raised a question. How similar should an icon be to a portrait? It's a totally new question and it's only since the 19th century we have photographs of saints. Can we use photographs? Why do we need icons if we have photographs? In the end, where is the edge, the border between the art, which is performed by an artist, image created by a photographer, and theology, which should confirm or reject a certain image? How all these things can be together? And I suggest we begin from ancient Greece and Rome because that's where portraits, I don't know, first portraits we know from Egypt and Rome and Greece. And they are all very different. Ancient Greeks painted them on clay pots, sometimes like this lady. And ancient Romans asked artists to paint their portraits on walls of their villas and people of Fayum oasis of Egypt, as you perfectly know, would have images painted on wooden boards. Of course, these portraits for people in Fayum were, I don't know, bearing a specific target. They were made for a special goal because the soul was supposed to recognize the body seeing the portrait. So Egyptians, put these faces or these portraits on the faces of their dead people. And we will not go deep into the history of portraits, but I'll have a question for everybody trying to think of the goals of these artists. So what qualities do you think were important to these people, to those who created this, this portrait, for example? Were they the same? as the goals of iconographers like what could be the difference how can you say this isn't an icon or this is an icon and why what are your thoughts or considerations can you share any any thoughts yes kelly sure um i think the volume or the egyptian uh, portraits are to reflect as close as possible what the actual person looked like, whereas the icons are more stylized and more simplified, uh, emulating the person, but not necessarily the person. I don't know. That's because you really don't have, you know, the earlier icons uh, is an idea you know, of the image. But I think older, the ones that are more contemporary, like I've seen one of St. Paul, the Pope, you know, or some other clergy that have been done in the 19th century, 20th century, let's say 20th century. And I think they look, they look more like the actual person rather than, it's an icon, it's like an I iconicized, I don't know if that's not a word, believe me, it's not a word, but it, it's like, it's the icon of them, but it's not really an icon, <laughs> if you want to know. The traditional, it's got traditional elements, but it looks more like the person. Mm -hmm. You know, they've taken, they've taken the stylized, they've taken, they've used the techniques that are used to make an icon the traditional like the icon that we know of to create the the person like saint pope john uh, john paul paul saint, the pope whom paul. you mentioned in the beginning yes uh, you mentioned yeah, him. yes exactly so that's my take on it okay <laughs> any more thoughts 
Um, Deborah, I, yes. I'm thinking. I'm not. I don't remember your question exactly, but I'm thinking about your about the the reason for a portrait and an icon at the same time is that the could question? this be no well the question is could this be an icon or the artists who were painting these things had specific goals and why would they be different from iconographers oh okay the i think the goal in in this picture and why would it be? It's very similar to an icon. And I think they're trying to portray in this woman um, a, a sense of, of peace and uh, graciousness, I, I, calm and beauty and wisdom and thoughtfulness, uh, uh, something inner that you can't describe in this. But there's a, a sense of nobility in her. And I think in icons, we're trying to portray something inner that can't be shown, except you try and portray a connection to the person and who they are. Mm hmm Yes. I'm totally with you. Probably here we see more this tendency towards portraying concrete features of the person rather than making image more abstracted, what iconographers used to, I don't have it as a goal, especially in later period. But, okay, yes, great, thank you. Sherry? Um, uh -huh. Yeah, looking at it too, um, you know, the fact that she has her, the beautiful necklace and the earrings, maybe it is her position in, in um, her society and her culture also is represented. And that's not any, I don't think that's anything that would be important to an iconographer, but maybe to an artist that is portraying a portrait of somebody who may have uh, a position of status. Hmm. No, I disagree. Because okay. there are lots of icons where we have portrait queens and kings with specific decorations. They may True. have necklaces and other things. True, so, you're right, you're right. No, yeah. I don't think that, that, well, they probably could be more stylized if that were an icon. That, that's right. So it probably is too realistic for an icon. But that, that might be. That, that's not an issue, I think. Or at least I guess. I don't know. Uh, okay. Any more thoughts? Joan? I don't know. It's very much of the physical for me. Yes. As I look at it. And... Um, it's, you know, it invites you in, you wonder who this woman may have been, but it doesn't convey a sense of the spiritual or the mm -hmm. window into heaven that I think that icons are supposed to, sh you know, share with the observer. Um, so I see that, you know, that it is quite different from an icon. Mm-hmm. Well, I totally agree with you, and I think your words come into connection with the words of Kelly and Deborah, who underlined the or desire of the author to make rather portrait features. So our choice is, in this case, leaning more towards the individual portrait of a certain person in a certain period of time of your life, instead of trying to show some overall picture of this lady, some more, how to say, uh, not universal, but rather metaphorical vision of hers, okay? So it's more like a photograph, less than a metaphorical vision, which could be more appropriate for an icon, because iconographers are not about picturing yourself, but to giving an idea of, of, of a saint, of some event. Okay, great, great connection. Thanks, everybody. Okay, um, well, I suggest we move on and we'll have another couple of chances to speak about these questions because iconography not only includes portraits, but also plays with certain rules we usually apply to portraits. 
from one hand. From the other hand, it's much more, it, it involves much more different means, many more means, for example, gilding and other things, or I don't know, precious stones attached to the surface. So it's such a complicated, even controversial thing. So it's difficult to know everything and to do the right thing because we always have to choose something. And I wanted to say that iconography is even an unusual type of art because it includes techniques and substances unpredictable or even the ones which are contradictory to each other. I like this one, for example, that the best glue for attaching the gold on bowl, bowl gilding, is rotten egg white, for example. So what worst substance on earth could someone use for iconography? And yet it's a very soft and very polishable glue one very often would use for applying on an icon. Well, here it's not for the iconography, it's for some, I don't know, vault gilding, and yet, it includes so many different things. And I just wanted to move forward to think of how we can begin answering. Because icons are supposed to be, or as we used to have them, aesthetically attractive and pleasing. But however, they are not made for sake of beauty. They are not relics, even though many people consider them a kind of surrogate of relics. Mm -hmm. Finally, icons are not made to make church look more decorated. They are an answer to a request rather than decoration. And the early portable icons, like this one, is probably the earliest one, is the fourth century. And right from the very beginning, we see distinct specific qualities of this image. They are made to help to focus in prayer and to stand before God, first of all. So they are portraying a young lady, but the way we feel in front of them is programmed by the artist, and he or she wanted us to feel standing in front of him, of creator, of God, and not just communicating visually with a lady on the portrait, on, on the image. So all the decisions an iconographer is making is somehow have to be somehow connected with this task. It may sound weird, but Christian icons are images for prayer and they have certain functionality. So they are a type of art where creative energy works hand in hand with responsibility. And the methods and working principles of iconographers have to be always subordinated to the main goal, creation of an image for prayer. Let's go back to portraits and to photographs because we often have lots of photos of contemporary saints. And these have gained a good reputation because we believe that the inner world of a person is somehow reflected in the way a person looks. Photos of Mother Teresa and other things like this one is going to be the Ioan of Kronstadt, a Russian saint of the beginning of 20th century, uh, they transmit amazing force of personality. It's not power in sense of uh, subordinating everybody, but really power of the person as having energy, I don't know, there are many, many specific words can be used, but I guess you understand what I mean. And it's literally the personality, or at least it's what iconographers are accustomed to depict. And that's what we see in icons after the seventh ecumenical council. It may sound strange, but exactly these photographs, which we see here, are very often source for our images, for our icons. And yet, we always have a choice. And the icon, or sorry, the photograph on the left 
is very different from the one on the right because they provide very different number of details, amount of visual information we are dealing with. And exactly these badly printed old photographs where nothing or almost nothing is distracting our attention from prayer are probably best because they meet all the classical requirements for icons. It's interesting to analyze how it all functions because if we talk about technique, it's not the best technique, but the worst technique, which produces these bad photographs, which give us the best results. In this case, it's imperfection of the image, which makes it perfect for prayer, for our purpose. Even though the photographer's main goal was most likely to reproduce the reality, if we want to use it as an image for prayer, we will rather choose an underexposed, overexposed, or simplistic black and white shot, because this technically unprofessional kind of image will be less distracting for a worshiper, as it has little or minor details to admire and to get carried away with, to analyze the fabric, the type of silver on the cross, and other things like that. Otherwise, if we take a professional studio photograph as the one on the right, our attention, our mind will always be wandering around, analyzing and looking at secondary data, secondary details, forgetting about the prayer. So what can we do as iconographers? For old saints, it's quite easy. We have patterns. Even, there's, even in case if we have no model for particular medieval saint, a professional iconographer can always find a model for garments, a model for the beard and the face. And similar types of saints can help you to build your own. You probably can't count on having any faithful image, so you can count on similar patterns and just move forward. You don't need to know exactly how certain details looked in real life and how they need to be transformed to fit in an icon because you just borrow the details from models from other images and you are set. And if the iconographer will pray and apply necessary efforts, the result will be decent. Sometimes you'll get more expressive image, sometimes it's a less powerful one, but we all know how to work with patterns. There is nothing to worry about. Working from photographs, iconographers face opposite problems. Excess of biographic information and often contradictory sources together with the fact that the same one saint can have hundreds of photographs and look very differently on different photographs. All this together, figuratively speaking, literally drones the icon painter in the ocean of possibilities. There are hundreds and hundreds of possibilities for this, for example, St. John of Kronstadt, who was photographed lots of times. And yet, to determine the solution to this problem, it is necessary to remember the theological foundation of the icon and compare our results with works of our predecessors, with what we used to call the tradition. And studying old icons, we will discover that none of them is eager to provide us with finest details of the facial structure or body construction, because these icons are more than just portraits. Icons are above time, and in most cases, depicting a saint, an iconographer should not try to capture the single historical moment from his or her life, but to make an image of his or her transfigured personality. From what we see on old models, painting an exact copy of the most attractive photograph doesn't seem to be the best method. It's useless and even harmful when we try to replicate in one medium what was done in another without modifications. It's just a lie and demonstration that we don't want to be artists. Because if you start thinking like artists, we should gather together all the most characteristic features and try to make our image become a synthesis.
not a summary of personal data. It should be a new vision, a, your personal vision provided for the church. This one was done by me several years ago. I did my best, and yet I think I could have made it better with more attention to the face and less to the secondary details. And it's the same with the icon of crucifixion. Without pretending to be a documentary of postures, positions, and facial expressions of the participants of the event, it nevertheless gives a possibility to pray to God through these people standing near the cross. And through their mediation, we do it. A good icon doesn't provoke us to check how faithfully the iconographer rendered the details of the scene. Similarly, painting an icon of a contemporary saint from a photograph, we must aim to make our image expressive and integrate rather than worry about faithfulness to a photograph. It's easy to be carried away by gilding or colorfulness, excessive realisticity or stylization, simplification or complication, but none of this has to prevail. None of this has a right to prevail if you paint an icon. Any of these qualities in reasonable proportion is fine and even necessary, but if we exaggerate any of them, it will destroy the harmony, the wholeness of the image, and ruin everything. Now I'd like to make a lyrical digression, because I have a sensation that someone may feel uncomfortable after my words about functionality of an icon. But yet, it's the best way to describe the problem. Acknowledging that not every type of art can be called liturgical, we establish the borders. They may seem very subjective, but when we put two or more images together, we can always say what they are and which of them corresponds better to the requirements we have. It may be about the type of an image or genre. Comparing them with the models, considering their visual side and their content we can even discuss whether the image corresponds to certain requirements or not. This can be applied to iconography. Most people who have heard about iconography will also have heard it's about following models and canons. This means that painting an icon from a photograph, we also have to have a model and we can assess the final result as a result of a study. So we can put a photograph of a saint and an icon painted from it and compare them. We can compare this new icon with old ones, analyzing them. And if it works well as an icon, it's wonderful. If it fits the format of an icon, if it corresponds the genre, it's a great tool for prayer. Not only the face or hand, but it should function the way an old icon's functions. In details, in everything, we should have no excuses. In our studio, we have an icon painted in so-called academic style at the end of the 19th century. I like it very much because of the very approach of the artist. He or she didn't try to stylize it, making it look more like Dionysius or Rublev the most famous Russian iconographers of the 15th century, nor did this artist try to paint this image to look like a photograph. This artist just did the job trying to do it well using a familiar visual language and talking about a saint with all possible professionalism and sincerity. Yet, most likely, we'll see something like this. Someone who studied how to paint portraits always has a great temptation to paint this icon the way he or she was taught. Make it like a portrait. It's not even a temptation. It's a professional automation. It's your hand which was trained in a certain way. It wants to continue working in the same way. We used to do certain things in the way we used to do them. And we don't think about that. That's how it works.
your whole education was about portraits. It's not easy to change everything. You'll paint everything three-dimensional unless you make a specific effort. In this icon, I guess the iconographer decided that it's enough to stylize the garment so the image will look like an icon. So this one is a saint which suffered after the revolution and her name is Ekaterina Artskaya, Petrogradskaya from St. Petersburg, which was murdered. And what we can say about this? It's a typical context problem because the photograph of this saint on the left and the picture was taken when this person wore a dress. But when iconographer decided that he or she wanted to paint the icon, this person was thinking like, okay, we know she was a martyr. Martyrs should be represented in what? In red garments. So he or she simply took the appearance from the photograph and added the red color to it. Technically, this person was right from many aspects because it's kind of portrait and it really corresponds to the requirement of a church showing the martyrs in red. But it's also important to feel, to see, to analyze what you see. Because for me, it was a kind of just mechanical decisions. And when I look at this image, I have a feeling that the red dress attracts much more attention than the face. Is it okay? I doubt but it just is a problem of how we make decisions, how it functions, because at the end, it matters not only if details strictly correspond to the rules, but even corresponding to the rules, they may very often be breaking the rules in their wholeness. Well, we'll see a few more images, but I think they'll also help to see another problem, because we need to come to some certain understanding of what is realisticity or how realistic should be the image because it's a very difficult thing. Sometimes we see even more serious issues like here, realistic image applied, glued on top of a fully iconographic background like patterns, gilding, zero connection between the portrait and what's behind it. It's a collage. It doesn't work like an icon. It's very sad. And the more I look at old images, the more I see that the old masters didn't try to prove they are very good at painting a 3D image. If they work on the surface, they were thinking within the surface without the desire to show that every wrinkle or hair has to demonstrate the depth of field, depth of the space behind the image. And even in looking at three-dimensional sculptures, like the one on the left, we see the understanding of space as belonging to the surface with which you're working. I guess it's because of school, which taught them to give depth to everything, but without exaggerating. And it happens that people of our time can't belong to the surface. They always seek for a possibility to create the depth, to give the volume, to demonstrate to the viewer or the beholder that this hand has a bit of shadow behind. This face is turning towards the beholder, but yet there is some depth behind. And he's holding this kind of violin in a way that we really feel how thick is the violin, how much depth is there. And <clears throat> I think it's also a question of goals and tasks. Because now we return to where we begin. If we think it's a portrait, why should we put the halo on top? If we think it's an icon, we should try to respect the rules which iconographers have been elaborating for centuries and try to subordinate these rules to obey what, what they suggest. 
Because if a iconographer has to make everybody smile and love this image, it's one thing. Or if iconographer wants to talk about serious subjects and wants to make an icon, a tool for prayer is another one. And it's not a question whether it's a photograph or an image. It's the matter of functionality of the image. How does it work? If on this colored photograph we somehow manage to get muted all secondary details and only see the face, that will function perfectly. Unlike this icon, which already is supposed to be functioning as an icon, and yet it has too many details, our eyes get lost. Oh, how nice decoration here and there, and how funny is this kind of pattern he applied and how this pattern is following the folds. So we get lost very quickly because the artist didn't think about it. The artist simply wanted us to believe he is good or she is good in painting a portrait, and that's what's achieved. So that's it. We can have hundreds of photographs, but if we are unable to synthesize, to find a solution which will correspond the requirements an icon should have, it's not working. That's it. Then it's better to take a bad photograph, which has little details, which has few things to distract our attention, and then it will be even better. Thank you very much.